we're never going to put this remote hearing genie back in the bottle, nor should we. We right. are giving parties a much more robust opportunity to participate in their legal process, their cases. Those cases belong to them. They don't belong to the lawyers. I love lawyers, but they belong to the clients. And to understand what's going on, to see what's going on. I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. Today's guest is the Honorable Jennifer D. Bailey, Administrative Judge of the 11th Judicial Circuit Court of Florida in the Circuit Civil Division. Judge, we're grateful to have you with us. Thank you so much. Well, Judge, what is on your mind most right now? Uh, what's on, most on my mind is how we continue to and improve upon the delivery of justice in the face of a pandemic that has upset all our lives and the other challenges that we are all facing right now in our communities. And I'd, I'd um, love to get a perspective on, you know, we're, we're seeing obviously an unprecedented rate of change in so many parts of, of society right now. And the uh, judicial system is, is not being, not isolated from that rapid change. You've been a circuit court judge in the Miami-Dade area of Florida for 25 years now. In those 25 years, how have you seen the system evolve since your career began? And I'd, I'd love for you to maybe contrast that with maybe the unbelievable amount of change you've seen in the last two and a half months to compare to that 25 years. You know, for... 20, 20, really it's, it's actually going on 27 now. For, for the first 20 years, um, everything was the same as the day I started practicing law with the exception that the memos became emails. And they didn't even become emails for everyone <laughs> because there were those right. that wouldn't even read email. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, within the past 10 years, people have started to realize as everything around their lives, right? Judges, judges and lawyers are not change enthusiasts. We are a traditional profession. Most of what we do is backward facing, not forward facing. We rely on precedent. We go look at it up. We look at a book, not that we have books anymore, but uh, you know, that's, that's where we find our, our roots, our comfort, our, our, the basis for what we do. And to embrace change and say, we need to think about doing this in a new and different way is just not the first place people go to. And so as a result of that, even with the changes that occurred in the past 10 years, with the advances of technology, where jurisdictions have gone to e-filing, gotten off paper, and have started to look at how to do things more efficiently. In many jurisdictions, and I know that, that you all have heard this phrase before, we papered the cow path because we didn't think about new ways to do what we were doing better using technology because a lot of us didn't really understand technology that well. Instead, we took what we were doing by taking a piece of paper that had to go from Sam to Susie to Jim and just sent it from Sam's email to Susie's email to Jim's email. Right. Um, so I think, but I think we've, we've, we were headed towards improvement in our business processes and really reevaluating because if, if you were designing a system of justice from scratch, this is not what you would design. A lot of what we do uh, incentivizes bad behavior as opposed to good behavior. Um, I'd be happy to offer up some examples of that. For example, discovery, the bane of everyone's existence who litigates. Um, currently, you send out a request to produce for interrogatories, the other side ignores you. You have an obligation to reach out to them, to meet and confer. You try and reach out to them and they said, oh, I'll get it to you. And they don't. And then so then you have to try and meet and confer again, write a couple letters, emails, whatever, no response. You file a motion. 
they you set your motion for hearing you have to wait in line to get the time with the judge for that hearing and state courts typically occur by a live hearing before pandemic and and then you go down in front of the court and and the judge says no you have to respond and the guy says i need 14 days <laughs> And you walk away with an order giving him the 14 days typically. Who won? I right. mean, you won your motion, but we've put all the costs of that process on the absolutely innocent party. Yet state court judges typically, most judges across the country are very reluctant to cost shift in those settings. So in any setting. And so the processes that we've designed really add a lot of barriers to efficiency and effectiveness and to holding parties that are non-compliant accountable. We impose costs on the innocent as opposed to the guilty in civil court typically. Costs and, and significant time delays. This is one of the reasons we maybe see the system operate in such a burdensome way. Well, so cost and delay, the bane of the civil courts We've been talking about it since Roscoe Pound. We haven't really done a whole lot about it because we've nibbled around the edges in terms of uh, creating these, what they call trans-substantive rule, where it's one size fits all for everything. And now, in light of these incentive issues we've identified, instead of streamlining the process, we just keep adding more rules. And adding more rules to try and create compliance with the rules that people weren't complying with in the first place isn't necessarily a sound solution as is evidenced by the continued problems under the rules. People complain about judges not enforcing the rules, which right. can be an issue. But if, if the rules aren't being enforced, the solution is not more rules. And by creating more rules to try and govern every species of bad behavior that we can possibly think of or that we encounter, we simply call, we, we reduce the, the, not just the efficacy, but the integrity and the respect for the rules at all as an institution or a means to run our courts with. So the, you know, what's the solution to that is to look for ways to streamline that process, look for ways to reduce delay, and that gets to my, um, area of uh, enthusiasm, which is civil case management. Tell us so, more about that. Yeah, so, so case management is one of those words that is fuzzy, right? People don't really know what you're talking about. If you've had a bad experience with a judge that ruined your summer vacation, you do not feel good about case management. But by and large, if you really think about what case management, it's just the process of moving the case from the beginning to the end, right? And the way we do it now is hectic and incidental. So you start a case. Not even that. Your client walks in with a case and he's going to, one of the first questions that client's going to ask you is, well, here's my problem. What are our options and how long is it going to take? And by and large, how long is it going to take is pretty much of a guess in most places. That it doesn't have to be that way. We can, as, as judges and as lawyers, we know about what cases should take. We know about how long a, an auto accident should take. We know about how long a mortgage, for, mortgage foreclosure should take. We know about how long a product liability case should take. Um, we can, instead of creating a system like we currently have that requires you, if you have an issue, to then file a motion and get in line with everybody else who has a motion with them to get access to the court, to get a ruling, to then go back, work the case some more, and wait for another issue to then get in line again, that, that just creates a, a, a trip by which you're just careening all over the countryside to your final destination. Instead, we can map from the beginning and say, look, you're an auto accident case, maybe 15 months, you know, so here's what I want. I want you to have your pleadings done by this date. I want you to have your fact discovery done by this date. I want you to have the expert discovery done by this date. Oh, judge, I can't possibly. Well, you know what? Try. 
I'm a reasonable woman. Come back to me when you've got a specific problem, but at least now you have metrics. And, and what we can do then is say to clients, look, this is what you can reasonably expect. We as courts can say, this is what you have a right to expect from us. If I am jammed up on hearings, then it's my responsibility to increase my capacity to make sure that I can get you in within a reasonable period of time. Um, and we can do that in a transparent way, and we can do it in a way that the public and lawyers can hold us accountable for the promises we're making about progressing their cases. The interesting thing about case management is that it, it's, this is not a new concept. I mean, it goes back to the 70s in terms of treating cases differently according to the type of case they are and setting up schedules for them and a roadmap for their trip through the court system. The lawyers, generally the American Board of Trial Advocates, the American College of Trial Lawyers, the ABA, state bar associations all over the country have formed civil justice commissions one after another and they all call for case management, yet it's still not widely utilized. And if it were, I am personally convinced, and I am a strong case manager, um, that it would make a huge difference in cases. It can engineer cases towards resolution when the parties are willing to work towards that. We've just recently seen that in Miami with a large mass tort case, the vast majority of which there were 22, um, 22 personal injury cases of which um, I think six were death cases arising out of a bridge collapse in Miami. I don't even want to speculate how many defendants were. There were a lot of defendants. And uh, that case is substantially resolved within two years. Before the NTSB issued its report on the collapse, that case was settled in principle with everybody but one defendant. But that's because of case management. Had that case proceeded in an ordinary way through uh, the system in front of 20 different judges, all with different schedules, all with different rates of throughput, you know, they'd still be at the pleading stage. And, and sums would be being chewed up on fees that would then not be available for settlement when it's clearly in the interest of the parties to do that. So, so it can both produce a quicker result of getting to trial, so you don't waste all your money in the lead up to trial and you still have the ability to go to trial because you haven't spent your entire war chest on discovery, but it can also help move cases to the point where parties can do the risk reward calculation at a reasonable time that produces uh, a, a solid result for everyone. So Jennifer, I'm curious, when you, when you describe it, it sounds like such an obviously superior alternative that you'd hope it would be pervasively adopted, and yet that's not, not what we're seeing. What, what's standing between this idea, like you said, that is, is not a new one, uh, and, and seeing more broad adoption? Well, you know, it's interesting. So um, I, I wrote a thesis on this um, for my uh, master's degree from the Duke University Law School a couple of years ago. And the whole question of my thesis was, why don't judges case manage? I mean, there's all the, the, all the leaders of the bar are calling for it. What gives? And the, the answer surprisingly were not, what, what the, to find out the answer, I surveyed 300 Florida trial judges, uh, my colleagues. Circuit Court Judges, um, which is the court of highest jurisdiction at the trial level in Florida. And the answer was not politics. We're elected judges. People worry about that. They suggest that as a reason. Judges didn't acknowledge that as a reason. It may play some role, but they didn't acknowledge it as a reason. And it wasn't a perception that it's not the judge's job. In fact, all the judges acknowledged that progressing the case is the judge's job. And they also all said that they don't trust the lawyers to do it. So you would think this would be a natural. It comes down to two things. Number one is there's a lack of definition of what it is and how to do it. Again, it's this really fuzzy term that can mean 
one of those eye of the beholder kind of vague things. So people don't really understand what it is or how to do it, um, which is basically just enforcing the rules and making sure that every time the case is handled, it results in forward momentum and creating access. And I'll get back to access. Then the second part of it is just institutional inertia. Courts are these tradition bound institutions. Not so much in the last six weeks, but for the most part, when judges come into a new section or a new assignment, they talk to the judge that was there ahead of them, as does their secretary. They find out how they do things. They find out how it works. And they tend to carry on that going forward instead of, as I said, trying to think, OK, is there, how do I make this better? Um, there's even, even among professionals of the level of, of judges, people worry about ruining the curve and wanting to um, go along and get along with others. But judges that do case manage have superior reputations. They're the judges that get elevated. They're the judges that are uh, the subject of popular bar polls. They're the judges that are asked to speak because they're a known quantity. Clients know, going back to your approach, you know, client-centering lawyers, clients want to know what's going to happen to their problem. I mean, they have a problem. Right. Nobody comes to court because they're happy. Right, it, a bad thing happened. It's our job to provide resolution of the bad thing. It might not always be a solution, but it's a resolution. They want to know what's going to happen. Why are we keeping them in suspense for years? So, the other part of case management that I think uh, judges fail to recognize, and even lawyers fail to recognize, is it's really not about the judge. It's about access to the judge. You need to know that you can get a hearing. If you know you can get a hearing, frequently you will not need that hearing because the threat of the hearing produces momentum. It's fundamentally what drives trial dates. 2% of cases go to the trial, yet the trial date is universally what drives American trial litigation. It makes no sense to manage our entire docket over something with through something that never or rarely occurs. We block out wide swaths of time to try cases and frequently end up with no cases to try because everything's settled or continued, which is not a good thing, and judges should not be so liberal with continuances. But then we're trying to backfill that time. And it's not an effective or efficient use of our inventory. Our product is less justice. It's always justice. I mean, let me make clear that that's, that is our North Star. But, but the path through that is through our time. And using our time effectively and the time that clients are paying for with the lawyers is really the core principle of case management. How can we make every dime spent on this case and every moment spent on this case as effective as possible and produce forward momentum towards resolution. Well, that's compelling. Uh, you, it, it, it feels like the, the right path yeah. forward. And, and, and maybe weaving in technology into this discussion, I'm, I'm, I'm curious when, when you think about the, what, what I think most people regard as a, uh, oncoming tsunami of legal issues yeah. that we will be dealing with on the other side of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and add to that maybe the, the tsunami of cases related to the, the civil unrest uh, across the country right now and, and a court system that is maybe less equipped than, than ever, at least from a physical perspective, to deal with those cases due to uh, social distancing. How do you think technology uh, and, and maybe case management and that that philosophy can apply here to actually increase access to justice and equip the system for dealing with this this unprecedented level of demand that we'll see in the coming months and years. I actually have experience with this because this will be my second tsunami. Um, I took I took over as presiding judge of the civil division forty five days after Lehman Brothers collapsed, 
And so timing in life is everything. Um, You've seen this, this before, <laughs> at least to an extent. Yeah. Yes. And well, so like to really, so before the recession of, of the, our, the 2009, 2010, we had about 7,000 foreclosures a year. Miami is a big jurisdiction. It's the fourth largest jurisdiction in the country, just because geographically we're a huge area. And by 2009, we had 70,000 foreclosures filed. Wow. Just in 2009. We had typically carry a caseload of around 35 to 45,000. By the end of 2010, it was 120,000 cases. So not only was that a huge influx of foreclosures, it was a challenge for every other case to get the oxygen to breathe. So that was really where I um, robustly embraced and advocated for case management in the first instance. Because listen, you cannot judge your way out of that hole. There are not enough hours in the day. Our judges went from 2,500 cases to 7,000 cases. The, the effect of that cue and the effect of every decision being made, you know, no matter how quickly you move those cases, and you didn't want to move them so quickly that they weren't accurate or right or just, it was more important and is always more important to do it, do it right than do it fast created great challenges. So the way we got out of that really was an institutionalized case management system. We created a system recognizing that the judge's time is the most valuable asset in, in the court system. We made sure before this, well, let me put it to you like this, before we instituted this system, about 70% of hearing time was squandered because plaintiffs would come in with their package, because typically these are one hearing cases, there's one hearing on a judicial summary ju mm -hmm. foreclosure, typically a summary judgment. They come in with their packets. And if you are a conscientious judge and you go through the packet to make sure everything is squared away and in order, something was always missing. And it was something stupid. But yet you weren't going to close the file without it there. So we created, we just basically created a system that said, you have to submit all your paperwork in advance. We're going to screen it. We had it screened by case managers who didn't make decisions but would red flag things that were out of line, bad, missing. If it was missing, they'd say, you can't have a hearing date till you get us this. And as a result, every hearing resulted in forward progress. Now, there were a lot of embedded problems in those dockets that became the subject of scandals all over the country and robo signing and all those sorts of issues. But we, at least in Miami, had the ability to make sure that the documents were in order, they were, they were appropriate, that the notes were appropriately endorsed, and could move through that caseload with some degree of efficiency. And as a result, we were among the first jurisdictions, if not maybe the first jurisdiction in Florida, to clear our backlog. We were out from under that by end of 14 beginning of 15. So, and, and just to replay some of the stats you mentioned, you talked about going from 2,000 cases to over 7,500 average throughput per judge. So you, you're, you saw more than tripling of oh. throughput oh, yeah. as a result of embracing. That's incredible. And, and, and people were miserable. I mean, listen, foreclosures are miserable cases. I'm sure. No one wants to throw people out of their house. And, you know, everything that people saw in the big short, I mean, that was real. <laughs> you know, we had nice people who were coming in going, yeah, I got in over my head. Here's the keys. I can't find the bank to give them back the keys. You know, it was just chaos. And so, and it made a huge difference in this community. I mean, a substantial portion of our Real estate is now owned by investors or um, non-residents uh, because of the opportunities that were presented there. But what really that showed and showed all the judges in my circuit is that case management is what made the difference. That's what allowed them to get out from under that that case load. And that was with very rudimentary technology. Like there was a SharePoint site right. where they had to upload the documents. I mean, it was built with like, I don't know, string and duct tape. 
practically, but we built it and we said- But you didn't need a multi-million dollar technology investment to make yeah, this happen right? either. Just, this was, this is a, when, when you describe case management and the philosophy, I, I actually hear a lot of parallels to the just-in-time manufacturing world and, absolutely. And, and the idea of a production pipeline. And you're just thinking about efficiency and throughput and making sure that you're doing quality right. assurance at the right stages and that you're not, like you said, ending up with so much waste in a system. And, and you're almost exactly. thinking about how do I maximize the amount of justice I can deliver uh, if I create the right kinds of systems supporting my time being used in the most effective way and ensuring that I'm not looking at 70% of cases that, that get thrown out or I'm not engineering a system around the 98% of cases that, that don't go to trial. Well, and, and, and not just that, but it's better justice because then your time is managed in such a way that you're looking at the things that really require the judicial attention, right? I'm not flipping through papers looking to see if Joe got, got served in person or by substitute service. I know that already. I'm looking at, hey, why is the notarization on this assignment from Pennsylvania when the address is in Florida? How did that work? So, so it, it, it gives you a better justice product because you get to focus on what the real issues are instead of getting lost in just paperwork, just shuffling paperwork, which, which we end up, you know, can consume a lot of time with judges. So um, what we did, and, and technology, so technology is a huge component of the opportunity that case management represents, right? Because there is a lot, and, and we're not even gonna begin to talk about AI because we're just on the beginning of AI. But before anybody gets creeped out about AI and thinks we're all gonna have robots deciding cases, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is just think about in terms of redaction, right? Redaction is a huge issue for courts because there's all this personal financial information floating around in our records that we don't want to get into the wrong hands. Right. So we have AI that goes and grabs the socials and grabs the, the bank account numbers and makes sure that those are blacked out or blocked on the court records. We can use that same sort of principle to triage your cases, to say, okay, I can look for these markers and determine that this is a car accident case. I can determine that this is a contract case. I can also determine that if it's a contract case, under the law, there's supposed to be an exhibit attached to it, which should be the contract. If the word exhibit's not there, maybe the contract's not there, that's a problem, do not pass, go, go back and somebody has to call out and say, get the contract attached. If you do that in the first 15 minutes of a case, you're now setting a forward momentum in that case. That's the kind of AI we're talking about. We can use natural language processing, and we're in the process of examining that, not my jurisdiction, but nationally, as to how to use that to help us triage cases, how to recognize when something's going south and maybe needs additional attention um, for parties that don't know how to call it up on a calendar, right. pro se, self-represented litigants. So there's opportunities there. There's other opportunities just simply by saying, hey, there was supposed to be an answer by this point in time. There's, there's no answer. What's going on? All of that can be Case, automated. All that can be automated. And, and for guys like you that live in this world, you're probably looking at me and going, really? You guys haven't done that? And the answer is no. No, we have not. Because the slogan in courts is typically yesterday's technology, tomorrow. So, <laughs> so but these are all things that, have been the topic of discussion. The Conference of Chief Justices came out with its Civil Justice and Improvements Initiative because of cost and delay in civil courts and the big em embrace of technology, embraced remote appearance. And yet, until 10 weeks ago, I had people that wouldn't even let lawyers appear on a phone conference. And now we are in a new world. So uh, there's a great quote from um, Milton Friedman that I thought I would share 
that I read, and, and don't give me credit for being smart about Milton Friedman. I read it in a Time article this week, <laughs> but he was talking about, because it's so good. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And right. that's so true. I mean, on March 13th, we're all going, oh my gosh, we're going to have to go remote. How are we going to do that? Right? And, and everybody just flocks to Zoom because Zoom is the easiest. Zoom is for complete idiots. We can all run it's, it. It's the idea laying around. It's the idea laying around. Case management is out there. I mean, the bottom line is we are going to face a, a truckload of cases, a, a caravan of truckloads of cases. And we're going to have to deal with those cases in a way that honors every one of them and, and delivers justice on every one of them. And to be able to do that, you can't just proceed helter-skelter depending on who calls up what today. You're going to have to organize the caseload. And organizing the caseload is fundamentally what case management is about. And it's, I'm hoping that by virtue of um, the fact that it's the, one of the ideas lying around, it will be embraced. And because of the opportunities that are presented by technology. But on top of that, and the other real problem that is on the forefront of everyone's mind in, the, in light of the pandemic is the traditional way to case manage, the way it happened was with the trial date goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, which never happens. Now, maybe if we manage cost and delay better, more trials will happen. But as it stands right now in the pandemic, it's going to be very difficult to get jury trials to assure the safety of jurors. Obviously, the four pillars, you know, hand hygiene, masks, social distancing, and at some level, you know, testing, sanitizing the buildings, that's all going to go on without question. But most of us are working in aged physical plants. Most of it, my courthouse was built in 1925 with social distancing. And it's one of those traditional courthouses that has a big base and then a tall spire kind of needle thing. In that tower part, I, I, don't, I can maybe get 10 people on those floors with social distancing. I can put two people at a time in an elevator. I have 576 employees that work in that building. The only way for me to have a jury trial is I have to keep all the employees out, allow you know one judge in at a time, basically, or two to try a case. We're going to pilot a case uh, in July, we hope, because we're still in phase one on the pandemic. We're still in an uptick. Um, and we're trying to figure out, as is everybody across America, how are we going to do jury trials? No matter what way we do it, we are not going to be able to do jury trials, I do not believe, at a sufficient volume to produce the incentive that forces people to resolve cases because they believe that they are on the eve of trial. I just don't think we're going to be able to produce that threat in most jurisdictions unless things really change with the pandemic. So now case management becomes really more critical because if you manage the entire case with the expectation of a trial date and then working backwards, which is how most litigation works, we don't have that scary end date anymore. So now it's going to become increasingly critical for judges to consider. And lawyers should be asking for this. Lawyers who want to serve their clients should be going in and asking for case management orders to set interim deadlines for fact discovery, expert discovery, damage exchange, you know, whatever you, inspections, whatever you need so that when and if trial opportunities present themselves, you'll be in a position to take advantage of them. Lawyers are also going to have to consider the creative alternatives that are coming up out of the grassroots level about how to try cases. I mean, Judge Miskell in Texas tried, uh, they did a test trial on Zoom. Other judges are doing yep. test trials yep. on Zoom. We're doing trials, you know, in Utah, uh, in Matheson, they did, you know, the jury was in one courtroom and 
the trial was in the other courtroom. Yeah, the level of ingenuity is huge. But no matter what, we're going to be slower. Lawyers also have to understand that your hearings are going to be on Zoom because of the challenges to the physical plant. Like I said, if I wanted to open up tomorrow, I couldn't because of the social dis distancing constraints in my building. I have one giant courtroom uh, that's the ceremonial courtroom that happens to be assigned to me because I'm the, the PJ there. And typically we can put 150 people in there. With social distancing, I can put 39. Our jury pool holds 300. On a typical day now, it, it can hold 60 people. Between April, May, no, March, April, and May, I had 1,448 trials delayed in my division, which included five tobacco cases, one four-week product liability case, which was mine, two med mal cases, and two long premises liability cases. I mean, where's all that going to go? <laughs> At the end, right. at plus, plus remember the caravan of trucks headed our way with all the eviction cases, all the business interruption coverage cases, all the breach of contract cases, all the construction delay cases. We're and, going and to have see, to manage that. Do you, do you see Zoom weaving into case management as well here in, in terms of how these, these hearings and, and trials are being held? I, well, first of all, the level, um, Justice, Chief Justice McCormick from Michigan has said repeatedly and, and very wisely so, it's not the disruption we wanted, but it's the disruption we needed. Right. So from this point of view where people wouldn't even hold telephone conferences, right? Judges, lawyers would have to beg to be able to appear. Sorry, that's the golden retriever. <laughs> that's no problem at all. <laughs> um, so, so it's a, as Chief Justice McCormick of Michigan has said, um, it's not the disruption we wanted, but it's the disruption we needed. So people, judges that, you know, 12 weeks ago wouldn't hold a telephone conference at a lawyer's request. Now every hearing is by Zoom, but now they're enthusiasts. Judges really like Zoom. And it's funny because I still have lawyers who say, oh no, I need to appear live. And, and I go, Okay, let's talk about this. Yes, when you're in front of me, I can see you in all your splendor. But I want you to understand that when you're standing in front of me in my courtroom, here's what I've got. I've got my computer over here with an email mm -hmm. popping up every 15 seconds. I've got my staff walking in and out. I've got lawyers walking in and out of the back. I have the next case in maybe in the back of the room. I have your opposing counsel over there. He may be swanning around the table somehow. The idea that you have my undivided attention is a pipe dream. I do my level best. I like to think I'm really an attentive judge, but the level of attention you get from me on a Zoom call is far more intense. I also have the ability to mute everybody else so you're not going to get interrupted. It has, my colleagues have observed, added a level of professionalism and a level of dignity to the hearings that sometimes didn't always happen in the wild, wild west of state courts. Um, and it's much more targeted. And it allows you to focus on the case and what's happening next. So judges in my in my area in Miami we're all contemplating setting and the lawyers are asking for it set case management conferences tell us what's going to happen with our case let's figure out what we're going to do we are evaluating every opportunity to get people to a resolution whether that's by a bench trial a zoom bench trial we like i said we're still in phase 1 our cases are still going up so so we're not even in a position to envision jury trials. But even with jury trials, I mean, when they happen pre-vaccine, it's clear. Everybody's gonna be wearing masks. I'm not sure that's gonna be a really rich jury experience for anyone. Right. Um, I, you know, I feel like the, law, the true trial lawyers, and I love trial, all trial lawyers love trial, right? That's like the crown jewel of American democracy. So one thing we do where we all participate in guaranteeing rights to each other, it is so much fun to be in trial. Trial lawyers love trial. 
And yet, at the same time, I, I'm saying to people, hey, we need to think about what we're going to do because we're going to be bringing people, compelling people to come down to courthouses in situations where they may have comorbidities, they may have health concerns. We need to, our concern, keep everybody safe, them, you, the staff, the judge, everybody. But not just that, we, you know, 12 weeks ago, nobody wanted to appear remote. Now we're Zooming all over the place. Maybe we need to think about how we deliver justice in these case resolutions. Look, a Zoom trial will never be, never replace the act of democracy that is a live jury trial, nor should it. On the other hand, I don't relish the idea of telling people it's going to be 2024, maybe before they can have that rich experience. And honestly, with the lawyers, it feels like they're doing Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, right? right I got right. this whole crew. I'm way down the road to acceptance. I got this whole crew way back on denial. And I'm trying to say to them, I don't want to give you this message, but I got to tell you the truth. You know, if you think you're going to be able to look, and, and we asked, we asked the epidemiologists, what if we got face shields, right? Because you can see through face shields. No, has to be masks. So, you know, there's our limits. We have to be guided by science and safety in terms of what we're asking of our citizens. So the idea that we can manage everything by a traditional jury trial, it's just not realistic until the situation with the pandemic changes. So the, the backstop to that is at least a case managed to these interim deadlines, get the case in the can, at that point in time, parties can perform the risk reward calculation. Now, are they going to settle the case at that point? They could, because settling a case on the eve of trial is a stupid and expensive time to, to settle a case. It's the most expensive time, but for appeal. But, you know, traditionally people had to have that moment of epiphany that happens when a jury is being called down. We're hoping that the 98% of cases that never go to trial will wise up during this process and perform that risk reward calculation. Certainly we can make sure that parties have gone through the discovery process, have completed discovery and have gone through mediation, which frequently people only do right before trial anyway. We can move that up. We can try and keep cases moving because what we can't do is let everything that's currently in the, in the pipeline back up with the new caseload coming in. That's just not a recipe for justice. But this, at the same time with case management, we're not just leaving it up in the air. We have the ability, if we have a case management order, to give you the ability or for us to look your clients in the eye and say, look, this is what we can do for you right now. And these are your options. The idea that there's one size of due process that everybody wants, I don't know that that's true. We do a lot of things online. You know, we certainly are voting on the voice and we've been voting people off the island for 25 years. So, so there may be clients who will say, you know, if I can get a resolution inside of a year, I'll do Zoom. Yeah. I don't need to be in a courtroom. Yeah. You know, because we, we can't impose our <clears throat> metrics on an entire generation that functions with an ease of technology that, you know, I still dream about. I will maybe someday attain. No, that's not going to happen. I will never be that great at it. But, but recognizing that there are people that are really comfortable with this, why shouldn't we give them the choice if that's what our best options are for them? Now, it needs to be an informed choice, right? right. But, and that also may have the benefit of opening up a, a huge swath of participation and access, you know, all the data from um, Rebecca Sandifer at the ABA Foundation that says, you know, it, what, like 86% of low to middle income Americans don't see any way to get their legal problems resolved in court because of, they just don't even think, first of all, a lot of them don't even recognize a legal problem when they have it. Secondly, they just think court is out of reach for them. That's inexcusable. Um, there was a reassuring statistic that a uh, uh, court administrator, the state, the state court administrator in Arizona shared with me where I think it, I, I 
I don't remember what city it was in, what jurisdiction it was in Arizona. Before going remote as a result of the pandemic, they had an 80% no-show rate on their evictions. Wow. Once they went on to remote appearance, it completely flipped to a 90% appearance rate. I mean, that's epic. That's phenomenal. That's a, it's phenomenal. And not just that, you know, the people that came in, sure, they may not have filed a, a, a legally elegant answer, but, you know, the bottom line is when you show up, pretty often you catch a break from for appearing. It's, yeah. it's legal, but typically it's a break offered to you by the other side. It's cash for keys. It could be whatever it is. You know, people would much rather work things out generally than, than walk away with a piece of paper from a judge that they have to enforce. That is so much better of a result that we achieved by nothing more than allowing remote hearings. And this would have never happened but for this pandemic. And this is the last part of the Milton Friedman quote. So the first part talks about the ideas lying around. But then he goes on to say, that I believe is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies and to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And that's what's happened here, right? So we're never going to put this remote hearing genie back in the bottle, nor should we. We right. are giving parties a much more robust opportunity to participate in their legal process, their cases. Those cases belong to them. They don't belong to the lawyers. I love lawyers, but they belong to the clients. And to understand what's going on, to see what's going on. I mean, even if we go back to live court, people should be able to see what's going on in their case. They should be able to see what's happening in their hearings. Um, and so the opportunities that technology presents in terms of, um, you know, I, I, was, I was talking just before we started, we created a, a integrated platform that's homegrown in Miami called CourtMap that is a uh, a judicial dashboard that does all the things that judges need with the digital file. But the really cool part of it is, you know, within the last three weeks, the technologists I work with were able to create a methodology by which we can automatically send notice of the Zoom hearing to everybody on the service list. And if, okay. you, regist and if you register, we can text you the Zoom information. So right. people can get the Zoom information on their cell phone and just tap the link and join. You know, that's, as opposed to getting a piece of paper in the mail that says courtroom 6-1 on, you know, right. that might get, three weeks from it, Tuesday. You can just see how it's re reducing so much friction around the, the system. It is. It well, is. Th th this has been a phenomenal conversation, Judge. I, I think your perspective on how both process and technology can work together to increase access to justice, to improve the throughput of the legal system when it, when it needs that throughput more than, than ever. Uh, it has been an incredible perspective and I hope that uh, the, the lawyers and judges and bar association leaders that are listening to this, this podcast uh, have been inspired by what you've described happening in, in your courtrooms and in Florida more broadly. It's, I, I think a great, a great message to, to share out and appreciate you taking the, the time with us today. Well, I, I just want to say there is, there are an army of people out there advocating for this, the national center for state courts, the conference of chief justices, the Institute for the advancement of the American legal system. I mean, I'm just, I'm just the person on the podcast today, but this is, this is critical. And the truth of the matter is judges will do this if lawyers ask them to. And your clients need you to ask them to, because your clients need to know what they can expect from us. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to get that message out, especially right now, because it's gonna make so much difference with the impending caseload, given the circumstances of the pandemic. And I hope everyone who is listening washes their hands and stay safe. Well, thank you. And that's a great call to action as well. Ask your judges for case management.
yes, that, that you want guidelines, you want deadlines, because deadlines produce action and deadlines produce resolution. And I promise you it will make a difference in how swiftly your case moves, no matter how many cases are in the system. Well, thanks so again thanks. for joining us, Judge. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider for supporting this podcast. 